Shalom, and welcome to Via Hafta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. As people of God, we need to respond properly to the things of this world. We need to be able to discern what is the source of them, are they from God or are they not, and respond obediently based upon the revelation of Scripture. We're going to be looking at a passage today that shows that that generation, those who were adults during the time of Yeshua's ministry, they would not respond properly. So here's a question for you. When you encounter the truth of God, are you willing to respond properly? If God reveals to you what is right and you're convicted inwardly, this is the right thing to do, do you desire to do that? In other words, do you have a rebellious spirit or a spirit of submissiveness? Realize, we've talked about this often, rebelliousness, according to the word of God, is likened to witchcraft. That is, it relates to those things that have an evil origin. And when I rebel against the truth of God, I am inviting evil influence into my life. Well, take out your Bible and look with me to the book of Matthew and chapter 11. The book of Matthew and chapter 11. We're going to begin with verse 16 and notice what Messiah does in this passage. He says, verse 16, And to what should I liken this generation? He's speaking about those individuals who were adults and were responsible. They had enough age maturity in order to discern, but they wouldn't respond to what they were being taught. So again, we have to ask ourselves, are we that type of individual, an individual that when God gives us insight, when he manifests truth to us, do we rebel or are we quick to respond? So he says, verse 16, and to what should I liken this generation? It is like children that sit in the marketplace. And these children, it says, and they call to their friends, those who are close to them, meaning many times this word might be translated as an associate or a comrade, someone that has a relationship. So it says, I liken this generation to a group of children that sit in the marketplace and they call to their friends and they say, we have played the flute for you and you would not dance. We have sung a dirge to you and you would not lament. Now, what this is speaking about is a group of people, and here's the key, who are non-responsive. You have pleasing music. They don't rejoice. They don't want to take part in that, join in. And when something's the exact opposite of that, when something is sad, something that, that causes uh, uh, one to, to lament, to be burdened, they don't even respond to that. Therefore, this generation, what Messiah is saying is this, that they are non-responsive. It doesn't matter what is going on, they don't want to participate. So again, we need to ask ourselves this important question. Do we want to participate in what God is up to? Are we individuals that once we are able to understand how God is moving, what is his truth, what is his purpose, 
Are we responsive? Do we want to play a role to participate or not? This generation, going back 2,000 years ago, they were non-responsive. That is, they were uninterested in the things of God. And here's what we need to ask ourselves. Does that describe me? Am I uninterested in the things of God? Not wanting to get involved in those things which are pleasing to God, those things that bring me into his presence because I'm uninterested in what is of the utmost interest to God. So this is how he speaks about this generation. Look on to verse 18. Here in verse 18, it gives another example. That word that I like, dichotomy. We see two choices that are, are very much apart from one another. Verse 18, for John, and of course this is John the Baptist, for John came not eating nor drinking. Now what does that mean? Does that mean that he was on some perpetual fast? It does not. It is speaking about John's approach to society. John didn't participate too much in, in social events. He was someone who was given over totally to the things of God. He didn't live where there was large numbers of people. He went out into the desert because... He was totally committed. Every aspect about him was committed to the things of God. So we read here, John, he didn't eat and drink, meaning he didn't uh, go to parties. He wasn't socially involved. And what did they say about him, that generation? Well, we read, and they said, he has a demon. What a horrible thing to say to accuse him of being demonically influenced because he was committed totally to the things of God. And now we have someone else that's mentioned. Keep reading, please, in this same passage, verse, verse 19. It says, The Son of Man came eating and drinking. What does that mean? He was socially involved. We know, for example, in John 2, he would go to a wedding. He got involved in social things, in society very much. He participated. So he was vastly different in some ways than John the Baptist. John being in the desert, Yeshua being with the people. But look again, verse 19. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they said, Behold, a man that is a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Now, again, we see both John doing one thing very different than Yeshua, being slandered, and likewise, Yeshua, being very different than John in his approach, not their commitment, but how they manifested that commitment. And we see that that society, that generation, slandered both of them. Why? It didn't matter the approach. They were against the things of God. So ask yourself that very important question. Are you against the things of God? If you are, realize there's going to be serious implication because of that. Get serious about the things that the Word of God reveals to us that God is serious about these things. Let's press on to the next verse, or actually the second part of verse 19. This is a very important uh, truth given here, and we need to make a, a statement. And that is, there is a, a difference between two primary Greek texts. We have what, what I'm using, the Texas Receptus. There's also another Greek New Testament that was, was put together by two men, and we call that Nestle Allen. And they're very, very similar. But at times, we have slight differences 
in the, the construction of words and sometimes vocabulary. And here is one such occasion. If you look here, probably in your Bible, it says this. And wisdom, and it's specifically the wisdom, the wisdom of God. Wisdom will be judged, that is, evaluated, proven. Wisdom will be judged by her, and your Bible probably says works or deeds, it's actions. Now, that's because Nestle Allen has that word for works or deeds. But in the Texas Receptus, we see something different. We see not the word deeds, but the word children. And this relates to offspring. It relates to the future. So what he's saying here is this. I'm coming, I'm doing work, but we will see your response in the generation of your offspring, of your children. And what was he referring to? Well, he was referring to the destruction of the temple that would happen 40 years later. So he came, he taught, he did his work perfectly as his heavenly father commanded him. And what happened? The people didn't respond, not that generation and not the next generation, their children. So their wisdom or the lack of wisdom was, was proven in that children, that next generation, when the temple was destroyed, the city of Jerusalem and the nation of Judah went into exile. Now, let's move on to the next section, verse, verse 20. Then he began to rebuke the cities in which were done his miracles, most of his miracles. Now, miracles are signs. So he's emphasizing these locations, most were done in the Galilee. And he speaks now to these individuals in the Galilee. We'll name those places in a moment. And he says, in the cities where most of my miracles were performed, notice their lack of response. It says, because they did not. This is why he was rebuking them. It says in our verse, he began to rebuke them. Why? Because they, look at the end of verse 20, because they did not repent. And it was that lack of repentance. How should we understand that? A lack of response. They were unresponsive, uninterested in the signs, the miracles that Yeshua was doing to clearly point out his identity and purpose and how others could participate in the things of God. Therefore, because of that, look now to verse 21. Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. Because if in Tyre and Sidon, the miracles that were done were done in you from old, meaning a long time before that, they in sackcloth and ashes would have repented. So we see a difference. In Lebanon, in these places, Tyre and Sidon, if Yeshua would have done most of those miracles that he did in those locations, they would have responded differently. So why didn't he? Very simple. God did not send him into those countries. To, to minister primarily to the Gentiles. He was sent, the scripture says, for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So we see that he says because of this lack of response, notice the word that's emphasized, woe. He says here, woe to you, Chorazin, woe to you, Bethsaida, because if in Tyre and Sidon, took place the miracles that were done in you long ago, they would have, with sackcloth and ashes, repent. Now look at verse 22. But I say to you, Tyre and Sidon, it will be more tolerable in the day of judgment, that is, for those cities, rather than you. 
Now, you meaning those in Chorazin and Bethsaida. He says it'll be more tolerable. Now, this is important because it teaches us that, that there are degrees of judgment. Is the eternal punishment eternal? Yes, it is. But there are degrees. And likewise, learn the alternative. Those who are in the kingdom of God, there will be also differences of rewards. That's why it says, seek to be great in the kingdom of God. That means to be a servant of all and be humble like our Lord and Savior. Well, now look at verse 23. And you, Kafar Nahum, this was the, the headquarters, the main city where Yeshua resided for his, his three years of, of service. And you, Capernaum, unto the heavens you are exalted. But unto the abyss, that is to Hades, you will be brought down. Now, what's his message here? Very simple. God honored Kephar Nahum. That city was established because of prophecy. We know from the end of Isaiah chapter 8, the beginning of chapter 9 of that same book of Isaiah, that the light of redemption, this revelation from God through the Mashiach, that is the Christ, would begin there in Kafarnahum, or what's said in English, Capernaum. And he says, look very carefully at it. He writes, and you, Kafarnahum, unto the heavens, you can be exalted because of his presence there. But he says, unto the abyss, to Hades, you will be brought down because if in Sodom were done the miracles that were done in you, what would have happened? They would have remained until this day. Now, this speaks a lot about the sovereignty of God. Notice what he says. He shows that all things he knows. He knows everything. But that does not mean that everything has been determined by him that what will be, he makes to be. Now, why do I say that? What did he just say? He says, if those miracles that were done in Kepharnachum, Messiah, who honored that place with his presence in obedience to prophetic truth, if he had done that in Sodom, Sodom would still be here and would not have been destroyed. So that shows that we should not be fatalists and not believe everything has been predetermined. That's a false understanding of the, the sovereignty of God. You say, well, why do you bring the sovereignty of God in it? Because God does just be patient. And we'll see how the scripture works together so that we interpret and understand things in a correct manner. We need to allow the word of God to influence our thoughts, not seek where we can justify our doctrines, our pet theology. That is an abomination before God. Now, verse 24. But I say to you that the land of Sodom, it will be more tolerable for you in the day of judgment than for you, meaning Capernaum. Now, once again, a difference in judgment. And he's proclaiming this because he is the king of kings and we could say the judge of judges. All matters of judgment have been given to the son. Now, let's move to verse 25. In that moment, Yeshua answered and said, I give thanks, that is a, a term of blessing. I bless you, Father. And this is why I speak of the sovereignty of God. We read, Lord of heaven and earth. That is an idiom that refers to, that relates to God being sovereign. Lord of heavens and earth. He is the ruler. But that does not mean that, that everything that happens, he makes happens. No, no. We find twice the term judgment is mentioned, and that's very important. Judgment because of why? Judgment because 
there is coming a time when Messiah will set everything in order. And those who have rebelled against God's wills, those who are indifferent, as sometimes I am and sometimes you are, and sometimes there are individuals that are consistently, constantly rebelling against the things of God. Why? It's what we began with. They're uninterested in the things of God. Be committed. Be individuals that take the revelation of God with all seriousness. So we read, In that time Yeshua answered and said, I bless you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have concealed these things from the wise and those that have understanding, and you have revealed them to the babes. Now, this is a word that refers to a small child, but here's the key. A child who is utterly, absolutely, totally dependent upon his, his parents. He, he can't do anything for himself. And that's how we need to understand. If we're going to do anything that's pleasing, glorifying to God, that which God says, well done to, it's not you or me. It is the Spirit of God accomplishing this through us, oftentimes in spite of us, our natural nature, that we submit and we, we, we respond in obedience to the leadership, the guidance, the provision, the insight, the wisdom of the Holy Spirit so that we can do what is right in God's eyes. So we need, and Messiah says in other places, we need to become like small children, trust him and obey him as a child obey his parents. Verse, verse 26. Yes, Father, thus, because thus, it came about and was right. It seemed proper before you. What was proper? Verse 27. That, that all things have been given to me by my Father. And no one knows the Son except the Father. So God has given to his Son all things. What does that mean? All authority. He is the ruler, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the Son of God. And we read, pay very close attention to what he says. All things have been given to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, nor the Father someone knows except the Son. So they have perfect, hear this, they have perfect knowledge of one another. What is that speaking to? It's speaking to the oneness. It is a reference to God the Father, God the Son, that God is one. Do I believe in the Trinity? Yes, I do. The Trinity does not at all attack that God is one. So we have three persons, one God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And, and that doctrine is increasingly being attacked today and it's a shameful thing when we don't study and see all the references people will say foolishly well the word trinity is not in the bible that's true but the bible in numerous verses expresses the truth of the trinity likewise look now to verse 27 second half nor the Father anyone knows except the Son. And, and here's the key, and to whom the Son desires to reveal. What does this verse say? Learn this all-important biblical principle. You can never know God, the Heavenly Father. You cannot know God until you know Yeshua, the Son. It is wrong. I know it's popular oftentimes in this Messianic movement. For people to say, well, because we believe in the God of Israel, we, we kind of by default, not knowingly, but we really nevertheless have accepted the Son. That's a heresy. Nowhere. In fact, the scripture says strongly, boldly, that that is false, just like here. 
Notice what the scripture is saying. Second part of verse 27. And to whom the Son wants to reveal. The only way you can know the Son, the only way you can know the Father is through the Son. Now verse 28. Because of that, notice the outcome of knowing the Son. Come to me, all, everyone, all the ones who are heavy laden, that means uh, just in stress and anxiety, feeling oppressed by, by the world, he says, all those who are heavy laden and who are burdened, he invites them, come to me. Why? And I will give to you rest. Isn't that a wonderful promise? We find rest. And that word rest is inherently related to a kingdom, a kingdom experience. Verse 29. You take up the, your, my yoke. Take up my yoke upon you. And notice this yoke is what is placed on an animal so that animal can be, be used for work. Notice what he says here. Take up my yoke upon you and learn from me. What's he telling here? As you serve him, serving him becomes a catalyst to learning. He reveals things to us. So take my yoke upon you and learn from me because calming, this is a word of, of serenity. It is a word of peace, inward peace, contentment. He says, because I am calming and humble of heart. He is, and when we accept his yoke, we will be as well. And you will find rest for your souls. Why? Last verse, verse 30. For my yoke is light. Now that word light can mean profitable as well. When you take his yoke upon us, it produces things which are good. So he says, my yoke, for my yoke, take upon you. He says later on, for my yoke is light and my burden is easy or not heavy. It's synonyms for the word light or easy or not burdensome. For my burden is not heavy. And he's telling us that when we submit to him, we are going to experience contentment, all that stress, anxiety, pressure, affliction, hardship of this world. He is going to give us that inner peace and tranquility and the power to overcome these things and to have a testimony that is pleasing to God and powerful in impacting others. Well, I'll close with that. Shalom from Israel. Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form. You may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel. <laughs>